Got it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Volunteer Orientation for Inspiritus Refugee and Immigration Services Department. My name is Lindsay Grovenstein, and I'm the Community Engagement Specialist here in the city of Savannah for Inspiritus. I'm really, really excited to be with uh, Mikvah Israel uh, and their congregation this evening to talk about um, a few things about what we do here in Savannah and how our volunteers help us. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So a little bit of our agenda um, today or this evening, we're going to cover who Inspiritus is. Um, formerly, uh, formerly, we were Lutheran Services of Georgia. We are the same organization. We just changed our name, I think, within the past year or so, just to be more, I think they were just trying to be more inclusive of all faiths in general, but we are, we were formerly Lutheran Services. We'll talk more about that. So we'll talk about who Inspiritus is, um, and then we'll talk about on a global scale, what this refugee resettlement looks like. Um, and then we're gonna narrow it down and talk about what do we specifically here do at Inspiritus in the city of Savannah to do resettlement. Then we'll cover how you help us to do that. Um, so we'll talk about the importance of the volunteers, um, how we really can't do this without you. And then we'll kind of cover some expectations and also some tips on um, you know, best practices and equipping you with tools to succeed and help our family succeed. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. So first and foremost, who is Inspiritus? What are we about? Our mission statement is that Inspiritus guides individuals and families on a path from surviving to thriving. So we wish to empower those whose lives have been disrupted to discover their strength and resilience and then become vibrant contributors to their community. So in spirit is, we actually have several programs and departments. Of course, we're talking about refugee and immigration services today, and we have several offices as well. Um, Savannah, Atlanta, but we're also based in Nashville. We have an office in Birmingham, um, Rome, Georgia, different places as well. Here in Savannah, our largest department is Refugee and Immigration Services. We also um, do children and family services where we work with foster and adoptive homes. We have a disability department and we do have that here in Savannah where we help individuals with um, intellectual and behavioral disabilities to obtain the support that they need. And then we also have a disaster response team where they organize efforts for long-term recoveries in areas that have been afflicted by natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes. Again, our mission through this in each of the departments is to get individuals and families from surviving to thriving. So in Spiritus, formerly Lutheran Services, we work in partnership with Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services or LIRS. LIRS is one of nine resettlement agencies here in the United States. So we're like an affiliate with them doing this work. Um, a little fact, four of those nine agencies are in Atlanta. So Atlanta, they've been, they're very big in resettling. Um, they resettle a lot of the refugees in Clarkston and I haven't had the pleasure to visit there yet, but Clarkston is actually the most diverse city in the entire world, or in the United States at least, um, because there's such a large population of migrants there um, and refugees. And so they have a really good infrastructure for it. So in Spiritus, um, we welcome refugees from around the world, from everywhere. But right now in this moment, we are have paused our regular resettlement efforts to focus on the Afghani crisis. So right now across the country, everybody is settling Afghanistan populations. And so I'm gonna talk about the experience from 
regular refugees and then we'll really we'll talk about like what this moment looks like um, right now with our Afghanis um, and technically we'll talk about this a little bit more about what you know what a refugee is um, technically our Afghanis are not um, refugees they have obtained humanitarian parole and now they have all the benefits of a refugee but they haven't had to go through some of the extensive prog um, some of the extensive steps like staying in a migrant camp um, they were literally taken from the airport to the military bases just a little tidbit but the services look the same so technically though what is a refugee a refugee is someone who has fled their home country and has crossed an international border for fear of prosecution for the following reasons and these are the five reasons only um, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Someone has to flee their country for like natural disasters like that doesn't they will not obtain refugee status and obtaining refugee status is actually um, quite difficult and extensive. And I stress that just um, because it's important for us as volunteers to be advocates to know this, to let other people know, you know, that um, uh, refugees have to go through a lot. Well, they have to go through a lot, they have to flee their country, and then they have to go through a lot to even prove that status and, and then to be welcomed into the program. And so, um, you know, they would much rather be in their home country, but, you know, sometimes you will come across some stigmas and misconceptions. Um, about that. Some people think they just want to come here, um, but that's not the case, obviously. And this is such a jarring number for me. Um, and actually, only 1% or less than 1% of the world's refugees are ever actually resettled. The majority of refugees will spend their entire or the rest of their lives in migrant camps. Um, resettlement is only for the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. Um, so the, the categories typically are women and girls at risk, survivors of violence and torture, family reunification efforts, um, high medical needs, and then of course, children at risk. So the governments and the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, they do a careful selection of refugees to see who can be, or who can, who can actually return to their home country and who can't. Again, just to stress what our refugees have gone through so much already, and then they also have to go through so much of just getting through this process. Um, and the majority of people in these situations will not receive refugee status. Um, another jarring percentage here, 82, or not percentage, but statistic, 82.4 million people worldwide were forcibly displaced at the end of 2020. It, hard to fathom that number. Tw only 20.7 million of them um, obtain refugee status. The majority of people you can see in green remain as quote, internally displaced people. Um, and then, you know, only a small percentage too are asylum seekers. Again, just to kind of stress their situation and what, and what they've gone through. Um, so where are our refugees coming from? Well, every year the president makes a determination for how many refugees uh, the United States will, um, will accept. And then they also prioritize certain countries as well. So 67% um, of refugees originate from just these five countries, um, but we do accept refugees from other countries. As you can see, Georgia in 2020, we welcomed families from 16 countries. So every year, um, the Refugee Resettlement Agency was started in 1980 and has always received bipartisan support. Um, however, the past administration did not support this process. Um, and in 2020, set the cap to the lowest it's ever been, as you can see, to just 15,000 refugees in 2020. Because of this, and we'll kind of look at what local numbers were, I wanna stress this um, because 
During the past four years, because there wasn't as many refugees allowed, that means that there wasn't the funding for these institutions either. So actually, Inspiritus or Lutheran Services at the time had to furlough a majority of our staff. Um, everybody, you know, whoever, um, my my predecessor, uh, the case managers, there was like two people who stayed on. Um, and then we just weren't welcoming people. So there were there weren't as many resources. So it's jumped from 15,000 in 2020 to President Biden uh, determining that we will welcome 125,000 in 2021. So whew, we have to build our capacity up really fast um, or as fast as you know these systems allow for it. So like I, I think I said in the beginning, I've been here for about two and a half months. Um, our client service manager, she's been here for a few months longer. My case managers are brand new. Now they're awesome and they're and they have experience doing stuff like this. But just to stress, you know, we are building up our capacity and our infrastructure. Um, and I stress that because you, our volunteers really help us to fill in the gaps um, and to help us do this work. And so not only are we trying to build up our capacity, but then we are now hit with our Afghani crisis and we are resettling more people than we ever have right now. Um, it's been a crazy past two months. So I kind of got started and jumped straight into it. We just started getting um, arrivals at the airport almost every week. Um, we have, so you can see here, um, the, well, technically right now it's fiscal year 2022. The fiscal year starts in October. Um, this is a, not an updated number. We have resettled 51 people so far in the past two months, 51 people. Um, as you can see last year, we resettled 25 people in the entire year. So in the first two or three months, of our fiscal year, we've resettled double the amount that we did last year. Um, and you can see even in the, week, in the years prior, um, it was lower. So we are, we are in the midst of it. And we are capped to receive 150 individuals by February. So we're about a third of the way there. Um, and again, I cannot stress the importance enough of volunteers and especially these sponsor groups uh, have been such a blessing. I've worked with um, three groups now and they, and we'll talk about what you do, but you guys really help us and not just the organization, but helping our clients and our families to um, transition successfully. So we'll talk about what that looks like, but I kind of want you to get like, what is the context of this situation right now? Um, just a little bit more about um, the, the resettlement process. So just we're familiar. Um, again, our Afghani friends, mm, they did not have to go to a migrant camp. So they're not technically refugees. And after we get our Afghani friends, then we'll start our regular resettlement. Um, and so step one, you have to leave your country for fear of persecution and cross that international border. And then you register with the UNHCR. And then you spend about 18, up to 18 months or longer in a migrant camp um, where they start extensive um, processing interviews where they interview each individual of the family and they do extensive security and background screening and, and checks. And during this time, um, you know, there are several countries that resettle. Um, our refugees don't know that they're coming to America. It's not like, oh, you know, they, they're here for the American dream. They just want somewhere to lay their head down and <laughs> feel safe and settled. And they don't know that they're going to the United States. So they're not practicing English. Um, they, you know, they could be practicing another language or should be, but they have no idea. But once they are assigned to the United States, then our own government has to do um, our own screening so we want to do our own background checks so then we do even more screening and security and interviews so even longer and then they're set on the airplane and sent to us where they're welcomed by 
your friendly neighborhood resettlement agency, in this case, and Spiritus here in Savannah. <sighs> so now we're gonna talk about, okay, so once they get here, what do we do? What does in Spiritus, what is our role? Um, how do our volunteers help that out? Um, we are with our clients through every step to get them on a path of, um, on a path to thriving. Um, we take care of a lot of their, their basic needs and get them started. So pre-arrival, when they come here, also wanna give you the context. We're receiving so many people that things are kind of a little crazy. And you may, when you start working with us, you may kind of notice that it's a scramble sometimes because we know that we have these families coming. Um, we don't know details, the, the right now, just the lines of the chains of command. We won't find out that we'll know we're getting a family maybe a week or two before, but we don't know what day they're coming. We don't know what time the airport, uh, the plane is coming until 72 hours beforehand, if we're lucky, um, sometimes 48 hours, and then it changes, right? So <laughs> you'll be assigned a family. Um, and what's great is that a lot of groups will come with us. So a staff member will be there at the airport, but this is where our volunteers help us fill in the gaps, um, helping us doing a welcome at the airport. Now we have a big group here and I feel like you guys could even sponsor two families. So you kind of don't want to overwhelm the families, right? Um, kind of need smaller groups. Um, and it, especially if we have people watching online, which is great. We have enough families for you all to sponsor or to work with too, but we'll talk about that. But we wouldn't want everybody in this room to meet us at the airport. It needs to be about three or four max. Because again, you don't want to overwhelm them. We've had a long flight, but some friendly faces and smiling faces is great. Um, help us transport our clients too has a big help because our van doesn't work. Um, we're working on that. So once we pick them up from the airport, we have to take them to their housing. Unfortunately, it will be more than likely temporary housing. Um, we do work to identify um, housing and apartments for our clients, but of course there's an affordable housing shortage um, everywhere, but we're definitely experience it here in Savannah. And we do have some partnerships aligned, but it does take time to uh, up to a few weeks to get them settled into their apartment. So we have, um, we do need more volunteers who are willing to host families in their home. Um, thankfully, we have a wonderful partnership with uh, Wesley uh, Monumental United Methodist, and they have a retreat center, Wesley Gardens, off of Burnside Island. Beautiful. And they have cabins, and they're letting our clients stay there, you know, pro bono, which has been a huge blessing because. If we can't find a temporary house, we have to place them in a hotel, which um, isn't ideal, but we have to do what we have to do. And unfortunately, the hotel, we'll talk about details, but they do get a one-time grant um, of welcome money, about $1,200 per person. Um, we know the cost of living and everything that you have to pay for, that money does go fast. Um, we don't give it to them all at one time. We try to taper it. Um, but um, if they have to stay at the hotel, that it does dwindle their welcome money. So we got to do what we got to do. All that to say is that you will take us, you will more than likely help us take our clients from the airport to their temporary house. We provide a first meal for them. Um, we, it has to be culturally appropriate. And so for our, our um, Afghani friends, a halal diet, which is what is unpermissible by the Quran. We work, we usually will tend to get um, order food from Al Salam Delhi, and that's downtown um, Habersham. He has an all halal diet, so we'll just order from them. It's been very helpful to have congregations take care of that, say, all right, I'll pick up the food, I'll meet you guys there. Um, and then we do a quick safety orientation. Um, we say, all right, this is how you lock the door. This is how you, this is hot water. This is how you operate the oven. Just a little basic. This is your exit if anything bad happens, right? Fire exits. And then we leave them alone because they've had a, 
a long flight. They just want to eat and rest. Um, but within 24 hours, they will be visited by their caseworker and then we'll start fun paperwork process, right? Ooh. So within the first 30 days, um, we take care of all of this. Um, and I believe the APA, which is the Afghan program, we have 90 days to do this, but we really try to do it within 30 days. Um, the caseworker will come up with a service plan, evaluate physical and mental health, or just help because it's all the same, um, and any concerns or um, issues going on within the family, we just evaluate that. Um, we work to enroll them in public benefits, so we get them food stamps, enroll them in Medicaid, we apply for their social security card. Mm. And I'll pause here to say that all of this, that pro this process um, is very slow right now. Usually when our refugees are going through the camps, they will come here with their social security card um, because they've already been through the process from the UNHCR. Um, they will get their food stamps really quick because all that paperwork has already been in process. But our Afghani friends, it's not the case. Um, so we're having to do it. And so things are taking longer. And because the entire country right now is resettling hundred, you know, tens of thousands of Afghanis, uh, the system is just backed up. So when you work with your families, you may notice a sense of um, um, a restlessness within them because they just have to wait. Because we also get them their um, employment card. Um, and even that's taking a long time. So, you know, a lot of them want to get to work, but they can't work yet. We say, here's your limited money. Oh, but you can't work yet. So you may notice like some impatience or some restlessness within them. And we'll talk about what your role is, but a big role here is for you to just encourage them um, to reiterate that it's taken care of, but it takes a while. And to always just, hey, have you talked to your caseworker about it? Because um, they will, they might ask you, they will more than likely kind of ask you, well, hey, do you know about my social security card? And you're going to be like, I don't know, you're not supposed to know that. Um, just tell them to talk to their caseworker. So we do find their apartment for them and we walk through like, this is what a lease is, um, go over the agreements, we get them started, we get their utilities started for them. Um, we supply through generous donations, clothing, we get them a, a cat card for our lovely public transportation here. Um, orient them on that process. We enroll them in English as a second language classes both virtual and in-person through Savannah Tech. We take them to health screenings at Curtis v. Cooper. We, are, we have an employment specialist and it's her job to create partnerships in the community and then to connect them to our, our clients. And so she will get them a job. Um, we enroll their kids in school. Uh, we help them come up with budget plans. <sighs> I think that's it. Oh, and cultural orientation. This is throughout. So we have um, the staff and I eventually want to get a team of volunteers to help us do our formal classes. So we do have formal cultural orientation class where here's a class for budgeting. Here's a class for your job, you know, like job culture. Here's a class for child care. And like we do very explicit and then they do an assessment afterwards. But cultural orientation is also an, an informal process where, and this is where our volunteers are, are crucial and critical as always, but this is, you really help us to cultural, to orient them to our American way of life and to our social norms um, and answer questions. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, um, but cultural orientation is very, very important. So that happens within the first 30 days. Um, or so, and then after that, we're involved with the families, but we don't have to be, we're not as involved. We kind of loosen up a little bit, taper off our services. We're always available if they need us, but our goal is self-sufficiency. So within the first few months, most of them are doing good. Um, they're figuring things out. Um, they do reach out to us occasionally, and usually by the end of the year, um, 
they are settled now. Uh, we do work with them for another five years if they need stuff. So every once in a while, we'll hear from people they need to, you know, reapply for something or emergencies, right? Um, but we can be like, all right, we did our job. I will say, so we are volunteers. I should have said this before, but it's called our first friends program through our volunteers, um, where you work with the families, especially in a group setting like this, committing to weekly visits um, and just kind of walking alongside the family. We do ask for a commitment, especially from our groups for up to six months. And so you do, you know, we kind of taper off a little bit. Their caseworker won't see them as much as they do within the first 30 days, but you will still be seeing them every week. Um, and then even that, that, well, and we'll talk about this, but that will have to taper off too. You know, maybe they become self-sufficient before six months and they don't need to see you every week. Um, can be tough for us because we get so invested, but ultimately that's really good for the client because they're good on their own. Um, you can still have a relationship, but the, the dynamic will shift a little bit. So they get culturally adjusted and then they are able to connect to other refugees and migrants in the community and then become thriving members of the city of Savannah and surrounding. So, well, how do we do that? So that's what we do, but how do we do that? Um, we'll talk more about that. I did mention that they get a one-time grant, their welcome money. Um, they'll get about 1,200 per person. This money though is stretched very far. Um, it does go towards their rent. It does go towards their utilities. Um, a bit of it. And then groceries. If you have a family of five and growing boys or, or girls, um, groceries go fast, right? Um, additional household items. And Spiritus, we do supply. We're required to supply um, and furnish the home with basic needs. So everyone has a bed. We'll, we'll supply that um, through donations. Um, however, in the past, we have had to dip into welcome money to get some of these items. Um, but you know, every, a table and a couch and um, dressers and then utensils and plates and um, toiletries and stuff. So we have to supply that. And right now our community is really stepping. Sorry, my cat just came in. Hey. Um, the community is really stepping up right now to to welcome, especially, I think everyone is really affected and concerned about the Afghani crisis and what happened. And so everybody's wanting to help us out. One second. Um, so thankfully we're getting a lot of donations from household items. So their welcome money can stay and help for groceries instead. And I know this is a lot of information. Um, I don't expect you all to like absorb it all at once. Um, but I wanna kind of give you the context. Of course, this re recording will be available. I will share the slides. But I just really wanna give you like a full context of who we are and what we do. So everything I just spoke about um, falls within, of course, our refugee and immigration services. And here at the circle, all working together, but we do have separate programs and roles and staff for these things. So our resettlement program, we call it RNP. Um, you know, we have caseworkers working through there. Um, our cultural orientation kind of blends into that. Um, staff does that, but again, I would love to get volunteers to help out those formal classes. Um, we have an employment specialist, again, DOA here in Savannah. It is her job to get, to make connections and to get them employed. And then to talk through with our clients, like, what does that look like? You know, um, we work eight hour work days most of the time, um, 40 hour work weeks, um, just things that we take for granted. We have to make very explicit and reiterate to our clients. We also have a youth service coordinator. We have an after school program for our kids. Um, right now it's virtual, but we're looking to do in person um, for the new year. And we are, we are in need of tutors for that. Um, if you're interested in working with kids, it's a great experience. So we do like homework tutoring, but we also are trying to expand to bring other programs to build up um, the resiliency and to be trauma sensitive. We also have a new hire, an intensive case manager. So if there's like 
extreme circumstances, health or trauma happening, just like, or someone's just very needy, we will, they will um, be referred to the intensive case management or where they get even more attention. And that kind of helps with our, the social adjustment services. Um, again, just mm, mm, additional, some people just do need additional support. You know, some clients, you know, within the first few months, they're good. You never hear from them. Some people do need additional support and we do help them with that. And then we have what's really exciting, our matching grant. So DOA, our employment specialist, is also does our matching grant. And if they work with her to get a job, and to be employed, they're enrolled in matching grant, um, which is what it sounds like. We've gotten a grant and then um, those funds can be matched based off of our volunteer hours, mileage and donations. So what you guys do is invaluable to us, but it also literally has like a, like, like a value to it, like a very tangible value which is why I will harp on you about tracking your hours because your hours, and I have a slide for this, literally translates to more money into our client's pocket. So again, they get that welcome money that's stretched very thin, um, but it's good for them to have some additional um, funds that they receive to really help them to build up a foundation to where they can succeed. So we all know, um, you know, the cost of living, even now, I think even all of us were like, what? Like this has gone up and everything's kind of up in price. Right. Um, and so again, any, the money really helps. So the magic grant is really great. Mm -mm -mm. Again, the APA program, um, gives us a little bit more wiggle room. That's just for the Afghanis, but it basically looks the same way. Okay, so I just talked about what we do, resettlement. Now let's let's get down to the nitty gritty. What do you do? What does what do volunteers do? Um, I think anybody who comes to this space wanting to volunteer with us already is bent towards wanting or already bent towards cultural sensitivity or towards yearning towards that. Um, but I do want to stress, you know we are trying to orient our clients to um, our culture, but at the same time, we want to develop cultural sensitivity towards their culture as well. Um, we don't want people to simulate so much that they lose their own identity, which is very, very sacred um, and invaluable to them. And so it's very important for us as volunteers who are working alongside of them, coming into their homes um, to, kind of develop and, and, and really dedicate themselves towards developing cultural competence. You're never all the way competent or always learning, right? Um, but it is important. And so in that, if we're trying to learn about their culture, um, it does help to do some self-examination. -exam and I'm gonna update these slides one of these days because um, I really wanna kind of get more into you know, explaining our own culture. If you're something, again, we kind of take for granted. Well, what, what is the U.S. culture? Well, the U.S. culture is also very diverse, right? Um, but there are some things that set us apart from other cultures in different parts of the world. Um, I was talking to um, one of our community partners that I personally just met um, over at the Hope Academy, and they um, formed a partnership with us five years ago where they work with a lot of the women to do like English club where they just kind of learn like conversational English, but they are like pros at cultural sensitivity. And he was, they were telling me that um, kind of looking at hot and cold, um, hot and cold cultures that they kind of have, for instance, here in America, you know, we value our independence and our individualism. We're very individualistic. Um, that tends to be a cold climate or like a cold culture. Um, our friends coming from Afghanistan come from the hot culture where it's more communal. Um, the individual isn't as valued as much as the group is. Um, so it's good for us to know like what are those dynamics. Um, but here, you know, if, uh, if you asked a fish what water was, could they really describe it? 
So it will be a fun exercise for you to really start being like, well, how do we, how do we describe our culture to someone? Um, but some basic things, you know, here in America, we do value equality. We're all created equal. Um, everybody, no matter where you come from, um, sometimes there can be like some tribal differences, but you know, here we're all the same. Doesn't matter if you're Hazara or, or another tribe in Afghanistan, we're all the same. Doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, we're all equal, right? Again, that independence and individualism we value. Other people have more group values. Um, here, you have to work hard, you know? Um, work hard and then you can succeed if you work hard enough, um, or so they say. Um, we value truth and honesty for most of us. Um, and also time, time, our concept of time is very different than a lot of cultures. Um, you know, we um, are very time oriented, you know, when, um, when your shift starts at 9 a.m., you need to be there before 9 a.m. or at 9 a.m. If you make plans with somebody, you need to be punctual or you need to let them know if you're going to be late. Um, some other cultures don't have that same type of strict concept of time. And also something I learned recently from the Hope Academy, they were telling me that, um, you know, here in America, when we visit with somebody, we don't want to take up a lot of their time. And that's a way for us to like be nice and polite and give them respect. You know, we don't want to just, just we don't want to uh, outrun our welcome, right? So we'll be like, all right, well, I'll get out of your hair. I'll leave. And, um, oops, go away. And, um, sorry, it's all distracting me. And in other cultures, um, especially I was told about this culture, um, time is actually, if I spend more time with you, then I'm valuing you. And we tend to think, well, I value you so much that I'm gonna like leave you to it. So when you do visit in the homes, even with the caseworkers, there's no quick visit. You have to sit down, they're gonna uh, offer you tea, they're gonna offer you food. And that's a way for them to really especially because they're very aware of the dynamic of, um, of their situation and that you are there to help them. And again, we'll kind of talk about how sometimes we want to help, but it's not actually helping our clients. Um, if you, and that's why we'll talk about, you know, we don't want you giving too many things to them because we want to teach them self-sufficiency, but also it kind of um, is a burden on them eventually because then they feel like they have to kind of even it out. So that's why, hey, I can offer you food and you can help me get on my feet. It's like this even, but eventually, and that's why with our groups, especially large groups like this, when you do your weekly visits, you know, again, we ask that it's not a lot of people visiting them because they're going to feel like they have to feed everybody. Um, and so you kind of want to keep it two to three, um, especially if you want to bring your family. You just don't want a lot of people. And we wouldn't want a lot of people just showing up either. Right. So. Um, so just keep that in mind that you'll probably get like a weekly schedule um, within the groups. It's great that like you don't have to do that weekly commitment. But as long as somebody in your group is visiting with them weekly. So then you can get on a nice rotation and again, sustain that six month commitment. Um, so I know everyone at first will want to like hang out and everyone can hang out, but again, you kind of want to do it in a, in a nice um, way that is respectful and sensitive to, to them as well. Um, do, do, do. So our privacy and formality, also there can be some differences in personal hygiene. You may want to kind of, um, really get to know them, may have to have conversations about like, hey, you know, this is this is what deodorant is and you have to like apply it. Um, and some of them like, they just don't know. They had deodorant in their shower. I don't know when they were doing it in the shower, but um, not its use. Or sometimes we have to have conversations to our women about feminine hygiene um, and stuff like that. So there is those differences of course too. Um, and I've touched on this, got a little ahead of myself, but I just can't stress enough um, that the role of our volunteers, our volunteers really want to give, give, give and help. Well, we have to make sure that we're helping in a way that's actually uplifting and helping our clients um, and not creating a sense of de dependency. Um, 
ultimately we want to restore their dignity and not create dependency. Um, so that's that fine line with charity work, right? Um, or with this type of work is that we're here to help and to serve. Um, and how can we serve in the most effective way? So, and I've already kind of seen this with some of our volunteers and families. Um, you have to set clear boundaries and we'll talk about that, but you want to avoid emotional dependency. Um, you are there to encourage them, but if they're calling you every time they're anxious about something, maybe that's a little bit too dependent and we need to talk about what those roles are. Um, you do want to be there to help them out, but again, it's about self-sufficiency. And, and if, if you feel like you have to sit there and listen to them, is it is there a way that you can refer them to something where they can um, help or I say like, hey, have you talked to your caseworker about this? Financial dependency. Um, do not give your clients or your families money directly. If you want to donate money, donate through in Spiritus and we'll make sure that they get the money. But don't do it yourself because then you're putting yourself in this dependent position. And also something I've learned recently about the culture is also they kind of tend to think, well, if you help me once, like you're going to keep helping me. Um, and we want to, again, for them to become self-sufficient. Um, in the beginning, we'll really ask you to help with transportation a lot. Because remember that big old list, you know, we may ask you, can you help with transportation to the health clinic? Can you help take them to the DMV to get their license? Can you take them to the bank? Um, we'll ask you for transportation at first. But eventually we, we don't want you supplying as much transportation because um, again, it's about self-sufficiency. So we'll, we will ask you to accompany them on the bus and teach them the bus system. So then they can start learning how to transport themselves. And many of our clients, after a few years, they take our driver's license, they get their permit and they get their license eventually. Um, so we do, so we will ask for transportation, but we want to make sure that every time they have to go get groceries, they're not calling you for transportation. Um, don't let them use your cell phone. Most of them will have their own cell phones. We make sure that they get a cell phone and a SIM card. And ultimately, this is about <laughs> avoiding a sense of paternalism. Um, I think we all obviously get invested with the family. Um, but we do want to avoid, again, because that's like this hierarchy that we're, we're trying to avoid. Um, because then that kind of puts them in this position. Um, and they're, they're aware of that, but some of them will try to take advantage of that. And again, we're, we're in the long run, it's detrimental to them because they're, they're not learning to be self-sufficient. And we do know um, the states can be rough sometimes if, if you are not picking yourself up by your bootstraps, so to speak, right? <sighs> But we do want to help and we do get them support, um, but there's just a fine line. Um, and ultimately, and it's too, I call it like, it's the Santa Claus mentality. Um, at first you will help them. Right now we may ask you to help out with groceries like once or twice, just because the paperwork is taking forever, their EBT card is taking forever and they can't work. Um, but again, that needs to be deliberated through us so that they still kind of know what, we are doing that we're facilitating that that it's not every time they need food they're calling uh rabbi haas and saying all right like we need groceries or we need mm. one time recently we a uh, group furnished an apartment and then they had donated or he had raised and done his own fundraiser and had additional money so we get them everything they need not everything they want necessarily like they'll ask us for different appliances, um, different kitchenware, um, a TV or a computer. We supply them with everything they need, not their wants. And um, <clears throat> this volunteer was able to get a few extra items, but then the family kept calling him and asking for more. He's like, oh, I need a desk. And I need a, can I get a lamp? And can I get this? Like, we're trying to avoid that. So I'll stress this again, and there's a slide for it, but like, it is okay for you to say no, 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 can't. Um, actually, I was told by the Hope Academy that you have to say no three times for it to really be a no for them. Um, they'll, uh, the, I think it's just a cultural thing. Like they'll just keep asking and asking and asking. Um, or you can say, I've been told inshallah, which means God willing, which is like the only word for maybe. 
maybe, God willing, it'll happen. But you are totally and encouraged to say no, to say, talk to your case manager. Oh, there's my slide. Very, very good to start with no, and then, or say, no, I'll talk to the caseworker. And it might turn into a maybe, you might get help. But we wanna be tolerant and firm with unrealistic demands. And again, this is about setting boundaries. So it's most, so it's helpful for our clients and to prevent your burnout. Because after a while, if you answer every call, you will get burnt out. Again, I said this, but do not give money directly to clients. Um, we want to avoid that. I talked about the transportation. <coughs> uh, we want to help them to navigate. And then this last little bullet about rumors, I kind of alluded to the restlessness that you may catch up on. And you'll be with the family from the very beginning. Um, so you may not notice the restlessness until a couple of weeks in when they're waiting on their paperwork and they're again uh, the cultural difference america we're very bureaucratic you know uh two to three business days and the mail takes forever and it's a holiday season right now like things just take a long time the paperwork the systems are slow um but you may hear some restlessness you may hear um rumors or you may hear this discontent like my caseworker is neglecting me when I guarantee you the caseworker has been talking to them a lot um so just know there's two sides to every story but we do want to hear about their discontent if they're anxious we want to know about it um and so as first friends as their sponsor um you really are like our first line of defense because you are seeing them more um every week and you start to hear things, you really are um, like the first eyes. And so we do want to hear what their side is, but also make sure to talk to us about it. And then you'll kind of see the full picture. Tips for collaboration, tips for our effective resettlement. Um, and finishing up here, um, it's very important. And this is a part of boundaries for you to stick to the schedule you determine with the client. Um, let them know what your availability is, especially if it's a big group like this. You know, you shouldn't have people just showing up. Oh, I'll take a Monday and I'll take a Wednesday. It should be kind of consistent for the client when the group will be showing up. Um, and then stick to that schedule. Um, and at first, you may have to keep reminding them. Be like, all right, okay, so Saturday morning is good. And then Friday, sending them a text being like, we're good for tomorrow, right? Um, just uh, sticking to the schedule and being consistent in that. Um, it is important, I touched on this, for you to be ready to separate from your clients when they feel self-sufficient. This can be hard for you, but it's healthy for the clients. And again, we do this work. It, this work makes us feel good, but it's not about making us feel good. It's about, you know, really helping out the client. So we do get attached. We do ask for you to loosen and to let go and then we'll get to you with another family i will say some of our clients and our volunteers create lasting relationships and they talk afterwards but again the roles change you may not be like all right every saturday i'm going to be here with you it may become more casual right um the roles will change but some of our clients and i will just be honest and frank um even from the get-go they may not be really interested in forming you know, deep bonds. Um, but again, your role isn't to form deep bonds, it's to support them through this. So you are acting as a friend. But I've noticed some of our clients, you know, it's just like their aptitude. They're not as friendly as some of our other families. Um, and they're, it's not like they're not friendly, but just, you know, we all have different personalities. And some of my volunteers have been like a little miffed by that. Um, and they're like, well, can I get someone else? And I'm like, no, oh, like, it's not about you. Uh, they still need your support. And then if they, after a few months, they may not need your support. Um, but at first, everyone kind of needs someone to stand alongside them. But if you come in genuinely, you should be able to form some bonds with them. But it also takes some time. It's slow. Our clients have been through a lot of trauma. And we all deal with trauma differently. Um, but you being consistent 
is what's really going to be like, okay, like, like these people show up. Um, so just, you know, and again, I'll, I'll have a slide about how to do this, but it's so important for you to track all of your hours, any mileage that you have. If you are doing transportation, tracking your mileage and then any donations that you receive or give, we have an in-kind donation form. Make sure you fill it out because that is tracked too. Again, for our matching grant, it's literally translated to money for our families. Um, so as I, you document your hours, and even in the preparation, there's been um, congregations who they are gathering donations for the apartment setup. So a lot of groups will, within their own um, congregations and communities, will um, will donate and will gather all of the items that we have to have for the apartment. So the family you're sponsoring, you'll just furnish their apartment with your donations. We do have a storage unit and we do have items. And if you don't collect everything, we can supplement, but it really helps if you guys can do some stuff like that. Um, all those hours, those can be tracked and please do keep track of that. Um, the most important thing is clear communication though. Um, volunteers, staff, and clients, we all kind of have to communicate with each other. Um, it's, a, it's definitely a team approach. Our staff, I work with the best team ever, and we work very closely. We're always uh, catching up with each other. Um, so again, you're there as a, as a first response, building these forms, helping them to orient to what our culture is like, what our norms are. Um, and if you do notice any concerns, again, encourage your refugees to talk to their case manager about any concerns, any of the process, any of the boring paperwork part, you know, they're waiting on something, encourage them to talk to their case manager, um, especially for jobs. They may want to work at first, but um, they can't work. Oh, we had one of our volunteers who was just trying to help, but... Mm, tried to find a job and schedule an interview and he, he doesn't have his paperwork. Like he, he literally can't work. So work through in the agency. Um, your job is also to be an advocate for our clients, but also an advocate for in spiritist. Um, some of our clients may have, um, you know, they're distrustful of governments or I think they were told a lot of things in transition. And so maybe this isn't what they thought it was going to be. Um, but you are really there to help our families to develop a trust in the process because they will be taken care of and they will be transitioned, but you are there to kind of be like to ease their worries and to help them develop a trust in the process. Um, and just a few tips. Um, again, we're just always trying to um, be respectful of language and culture. So just pay attention to gestures. Um, I was told recently, like, you, well, you, I think well, many of us have heard this, you know, like, don't use your left hand when you're doing a handshake, right? And, um, different gestures that we do, um, uh, be mindful of male to female interactions, especially with our, um, Afghani friends that kind of tends to be, um, and it's more like, uh, I would say the males are are fine speaking with other people, but you'll notice maybe some shyness in the females. Um, and be aware of our own cultural assumptions about touching and eye contact. Um, when you do communicate, um, our clients, some of the men will speak English because they've worked with the military. Um, and some of them do not, or they speak some English, some are fluent, but some are just kind of have an understanding. Typically the women, um, will not speak English. Some of the, the young children will not speak English. So there will be prepared for a, a, a language barrier. And so with that, even if they do have an understanding and a grasp of English, be sure to speak slowly. And which I always have to remind myself of, if you haven't noticed I'm a fast talker. Um, pause between words, speak in full, simple, short sentences. Of course, the English language is beautiful. We have so many words for so many things, but you really just want to keep it concise. And I cannot repeat or reiterate how important it is to repeat yourself, um, to repeat information about the process and to just repeat the sentences to help with that understanding. 
Um, it is okay to use children. Um, if the older children um, usually have a better grasp on it, it can help with that translation. We do have remote translators that we get on calls for like, you know, the, the nitty gritty paperwork stuff when they first arrive at the airport. Um, even when we do an initial introduction, we, we will have an official translator there. Um, but in your interactions, you know, um, just practice empathy. If you feel a little frustrated and impatient at the exchange, just know they are probably feeling that too. So just embrace that we're, we're both kind of experiencing this as a shared thing. Embrace the awkward, embrace that space and hold that space. Um, give time for a response and then get creative with it. Um, you know, draw pictures if you have to, um, use gestures, um, you know, pantomime things out. Uh, we have to eat and drink and, you know, we're waiting and just different things. You'll just have fun with it. And then Google Translate is a life savior. Most of our clients speak Farsi. Um, some of them Pashto, it's like different variances. Um, they do not have Farsi, but it's Persian on Google Translate, by the way. So just a, a few other um, things I, I do need to address. Um, again, we wanna seek to understand their culture. Um, do your own little background research. I have a resource for that. Um, and it's great. People will share stuff with me and I try to share it with you. Again, that's a part of continuing education. It's like, how can we be better advocates and allies? Um, with your dress, when you go and visit, it's just safe to dress more modestly. Um, you know, no low cut or short shorts or for anybody. Um, for religion. So, uh, and Spirit is, we are a faith-based nonprofit, but we are a nonprofit uh, funded through the government. Uh, we are not a ministry. And I've learned that I have to be explicit about that. So our mission, our goal is to successfully resettle our refugees. Our goal is not to convert them. Um, so again, we're not a ministry. We do work with church groups. We do work with um, varying faiths so excited having Israel helping us as well. Um, well. We do have a strict no proselytizing policy. We ask that you show your faith through your actions, not through your words. Um, again, our refugees, they have had all material. I'm just going to put her on. Material possessions stripped away from them. And if they do have um, religious affiliation, they are Muslim their faith has been the one thing that they can really cling to and it's probably helped them through this. And I've noticed some of our clients want nothing to do with religion at all because they come from oppressive countries. So if you form a relationship, a genuine relationship, they may, you know, the topic may come up and you can talk about it. You can eventually, we ask that you like don't invite them to service for a while. Um, Eventually, you can bring it up if you want, but they're not obligated to come. Um, and some groups will even offer to take them to the mosque, which I think is very, very nice. Um, something to keep in mind. And then we ask that you do not ask about their story. Um, you know, be like, so you escaped from Cabal? Like, don't bring it up. Um, if they do start to tell you their story, handle that with care, hold space for it, um, and keep it to yourself as well. Um, I have a slide for this, but we just ask that you um, keep it confidential. I mentioned that I have a resource for you if you wanna learn more about different cultures. The Cultural Orientation Resource Center has um, literature on various populations. Definitely recommend taking a look through it. And swinging back, if you get, if you do hear personal information, we ask that you do not share it. Just think again, uh, what, what would I want in this situation? Would you want this shared about your family? Um, or is this need to know? So especially, you know, you may take some photos and some people have printed photos for the families, which is really special, but we ask that you do not post photos online. We of course live in a social media 
um, age and if you don't post it, you didn't do it, but we ask that you really um, do not share. Um, you can say that you are volunteering with us, but just don't, you don't want to give out details. Um, and of course, we want you to post on Facebook that you're volunteering with us. We want to spread the word, but you know, just just be careful. Um, if you are telling a story to a really close friend or family, um, we ask that you do keep a lot of details to yourself, but you can tell some stories. We just ask that you don't share their name um, in any identifying details. I will say, especially our Afghanis, they are very, this is a very big point for them. Um, many of them have families still in Afghanistan who are under direct threat from the Taliban. And if they find out, um, some of them just are, are very secretive about that. And it's because they're trying to, um, trying to keep their families safe. Um, just a little bit more um, and wrapping up here. So, I know I was just kind of stressing a bunch of things earlier, you know, the importance of setting boundaries. And we do want you to create meaningful bonds and then to help orient our, our families. Um, but again, this is about the long run. This is about the six months that you have and the years to come that they have. Um, so it's important for you to set boundaries and to be consistent. And I'm just right now, I'm trying to set realistic expectations for you. Um, but it's good for you within the group to set expectations. Um, again, you know, our, our refugees have had difficult pasts and they face present disappointments. And so they're all at different levels of being open. Um, they're all at different levels. Um, and of course, we're all we're all different, but ultimately we want to prevent your burnout so that you can help us for the long run. Um, and then some logistics. Oh, here's one slide I got taken out of, you know, I haven't talked about like the specifics, you know, what is cult, like, what, what do you do when you're visiting? A lot of it's just, you know, sit, sit down and have tea, tell them about yourself. Um, if you have kids, we'd love for you to bring kids around with the kids, with their children to play, um, asking questions about themselves and their interests, and then just kind of helping them, you know, you know, ask, asking, Hey, do you know how to check your mail? Have you checked your mail? All right, let's go figure that out. And then when they get their mail, all right, so this is bills. This is junk mail. You can throw this away. This is someone else's mail who did not change their uh, their address and we keep getting their mail. You need to tell them that. Um, you need to tell them, again, about personal hygiene that, um, and that comes later, but like, you know, we've noticed, like you have to send your child to school with shoes on. Um, this is how you read the school calendar. Um, this is what a field day is. You do have to send them to, to school for it. Um, one time we had a family and like she read field day and her kids didn't go to school and the volunteer was over there and she was like, that's weird. And then she talked through with the, with the mom and now she understood helping them navigate the parent portal. <laughs> that's hard for us to do, much less someone who's brand new to our, to our, um, way of doing things. How to grocery shop. There was one, um, young lady here by herself literally spent four hours walking through a Kroger trying to find stuff and, and didn't even really find what she needed. Um, so like navigating the aisles and then once they get their groceries, what needs to be refrigerated? Um, how do you cook with some of our American items? You know, what do you do with this? Um, talking through budgeting, if you're good with budgeting, um, talking through that as well, because you, you do know that they have limited money and they may talk to you about that anyways, because they're stressed. Um, the public transport, helping them with the bus. Um, and then we also like do outings. So you kind of, um, we encourage you to, if you're able to transport them and do something fun. Uh, we've had people take our families to Oatland Island, um, to the beach, you know, to even like on Riverside or River Street and walk around. It's very, good for them to actually see the city that they're living in. Um, but a lot of it is just sitting and being with them and sharing space. And a lot of things will come up in between. Um, another tip for collaboration is just constant communication. Um, I love hearing from our volunteers. 
uh, updating me, like asking questions, any questions that you have when you start this journey, please let me know. That is why I'm here is to support you. Um, you can never ask me too many questions. Um, and I'm learning with you as well. Um, we do have our best practices, but we learn from each other. And, um, but it's the volunteers I never hear from, I start to get a little bit worried. So um, that really helps us. So logistics, wrapping up. We have our quick onboarding process. Everybody has to go through three quick steps. Um, we have already completed one of them, uh, attending our orientation. Um, you, all of you will also need to register as a volunteer on our My Better Impact page. And this is where you track your hours. A very simple process. And then um, everyone also has to go through a background check. Um, we do our own background. We do ask, because we're a nonprofit, that you make a donation towards that background check of $35. Um, but we also take some congregations will do their own background checks for their different programs. And uh, we do take, if you have your own internal background check or if you have one that's available, we do take that as well. All right, cool. And so I went over this a little, the role of a first friend, you know, really you're there to answer any questions that they have. Um, you're there to encourage their morale and to reiterate the process and to create trust. Um, you provide community orientation and outings. And then even just talking with them really helps to promote English language in a conversational way. Um, and then of course, you are to be a friend during their transition. And I like to say not, not only a friend, but an advocate. So like really advocating on behalf of them when you're out, taking them to, you know, their health screening and making sure that you know, Curtis B. Cooper, any health place has to provide a translator, um, making sure that they get that, you know, just, just being with them and helping. And importantly, when you're out and about in the community, helping our other neighbors, our Savannah neighbors, advocating on behalf of our refugees to them. Um, many people are welcoming, but there are people who are not welcoming and do not like the idea of 150 Afghanis resettling here. Um, so is our, if we wanna help our families, we also wanna help to create an environment in the community that's very welcoming as well. So just, you know, being there to break people's misconceptions and just being an advocate and spreading the good word. Um, another big role that you have. Mm, 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 mm. So anybody in Georgia is a mandated reporter. If you are suspicious or see any um, child abuse or neglect, you need to report that. Um, but anything else too, we just ask that you report if you are listening and you notice that they are really struggling financially. If there's any safety concerns, if you hear them talking about quitting their job or moving somewhere, or just any major health concerns, um, um, physical and of course, any mental health, um, please let us know. Again, our, our dynamic of communication is key to, this, to our success and for the long term of our families. Mm -mm -mm. I talked about the value of your volunteer hours. So this is each hour you give is literally $25 and that's been increased to, I want to say 30 cents each hour. That's how much money it is. Um, your mileage is also valued at 58 cents and that adds up real quick. And so again, what you do is invaluable, but it also literally has a tangible outcome as well. So again, so important for you to track your hours um, and then any donations as well helps towards that. So finally, this is how you log your hours. Once you create a login on Better Impact, which I'll make sure you have that link. It's really easy, just a username, password, you know, the usual. You will then have your account to Better Impact. This is your homepage. You click on the tab hours. Once you're on hours, you go down to the Dropbox. I will assign you an activity. So you will be first friend. Um, if you're a tutor, you will be under our tutoring program, um, apartment setup, but more than likely you will just be a first friend. Um, and then once it takes a while for them to be enrolled in that matching grant, and then I'll make sure that you're a match grant first friend and make sure that you specify that. Once you do, 
um, you click the date. And it is recommended that when you know, that you track it as you go. Some people will um, do it all at once at the end of the month. So you can just do one large entry. Um, hopefully you're keeping track of it on your own and not just trying to estimate but it is just best for you to just come in here and do it as you go. How many hours, how many miles, if you donated anything, and then volunteer comments. This is a long comment. You don't have to be, you know, super detailed, especially if you're communicating with me on a regular basis anyways. But I do like to know just a little bit what you're doing so I can reference it during our reporting because I can't remember everything either when it comes to reporting. And then that, that is it. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us or for, for with me this evening. Thank you for wanting to give this service. It is such a beautiful experience. Like we're, we're high volume. It's a lot going on right now, but it's a beautiful time to get started. And so again, I know I just gave you a lot of information. Um, I'm sure you will have questions now, and I'm sure you will also have questions once you start the journey again please always reach out to me and we will continue to learn together. So I will now um, give some space and time for us to answer some questions. I'm sure you may have some. Hi, this is Ira Schwartz. Uh, have these mm -hmm. people been fully um, immunized? Good question. Yes, they have all been vaccinated um, when they were in the military base for a few months. Let me see, Margie, I see you have your hand up. She's muted. Oh yeah, you're muted. Do they have tablets or computers and access to Wi-Fi when they come? Um, we will get them set up with Wi-Fi and um, might take a little bit. And then they actually, be, there's this great program that if they have an EBT, they get free Wi-Fi. Um, but no, we, that's kind of one of those want items, um, computers and tablets. Although I know at one point the schools were doing that, but I don't think they are now. Um, but if you want to supply that with your family, you know, again, you guys can do some of the additional, especially in the beginning. Um, needs and are, and are they supplied with a cell phone so they can communicate we do give them a cell phone we do help them get a cell phone in a sims card and many of them will use um, texting and then whatsapp of course as well to communicate with those far away my apologies if this was answered when i had to step out but um are we as a congregation going to and I use the word in quotes, ad adopt or have one or two families that we all are going to coordinate together and take care of, or are several of us going to take on a responsibility for a particular family and then have a group working with each family? How is that work? How, how are the families, 150 coming into Savannah, who's going to be, how many Mikvah Israel families will there be? Um. And that's a good question, and I think it's a little bit of, of both. I do think we have the capacity here to do at least two families, um, and then within yourselves, coordinate, you know, who would go where and what those schedules look like and who can do airport arrival, and, like, from there, and, and Rabbi Haas, this would be good for you to know, I really recommend to get, like, a point person for the group, and so that person is then kind of co-coordinating with, with me with the group, you know? So it's, it's hard for me to coordinate these, all these groups, but if someone can recommend or be a point person per family, that's very, very helpful. Um, and then from there kind of deciding, well, this is my capacity. Um, this is when my availability is. And then we do want to be able to serve, even if you can't commit. And again, with the groups, it helps because we want you to visit the group or the family to be visited weekly. But if you have a group, you don't have to visit weekly but you will have like, oh, I know I'm going to see them on the second Tuesday or whatever it is. Or maybe you can only help out with a certain portion um, or with a transportation every once in a while. Um, 
but we do just want to create space for people to be able to serve in whatever capacity they have. Um, okay, so so it sounds like let's assume that it's two. We we may have two families that we're going to adopt and look after, and so we we'll have to come up as a group with perhaps two teams: mm-hmm. team for the the Weinstein family and team for the Silverstein family, and. Uh, with, with Afghanistan names, of course, but um, and and each team, team A and team B, will have separate functions amongst ourselves for each family. We won't all be taking care of two. It sounds like we're better off splitting team A and team B and having two separate groups looking at so that the family gets to know a group of people and they become their center, and the other family has. And then we can perhaps do community things where, where both families get to get together with all the people. Is, yeah. it, is that, Robert, what you, you have in mind for us? Well, I think that's what we're going to discuss. Do we need to have a separate meeting to determine how many people usually does it take for a family to, to work with one family? Well, I mean, we can have just a, a few people. Um, we do ask that the groups no more than eight people visiting with the family like in rotation just because again we want to make these deep bonds and if they're visited by like more than that you know it gets a little stretched um and even eight can be like stretching it and an eight can be like you know a family you know and I'm gonna take my kids and my wife that's one and then like so eight represent representation um is the max that we do per family but then some people, you know, some people just want to help out with, you know, oh, I can just help transport them or just do the little things. But the the commit the, the committed, um, that's kind of the the group. And so yeah, I think it would take within within yourself. Um, again, so having that point person, someone who says, all right, I'll be the point person for team A or and then group B, and then kind of within yourself determining, you know, saying, all right, we need to. Um, raise some donations when you know who's got a couch who's got a bed and someone coordinating that and then someone has a big role um, coordinating you know who's going to make sure we have the food picked up you know um, someone who can take on that role and everyone else can be the supporters okay may I speak I'm sorry this is Marsha Aarons. Um, so all this is just brings back some very pleasant memories um, and some difficult memories. Mm-hmm. So um, I kind of see us having a gathering at the temple with those that are very interested. I see it under one umbrella, different from Tony's vision. And then you're going to have duplication of services. Um, I see... Some thing, some people are going to be more involved with being like a host family, and they're the ones that are closer than those that are going to fix the apartment up or do the shopping or, you know, do some of the, the schlepping to where the people have to go. Um, um, but I think from my experience, the host families, and, and we would have... Um, either one or two families assigned as a host family, depending upon the size of the family that we, that was coming in. Um, but I, if time allows, I would love to be involved in some way. Um, so I'm interested in the next meeting. I have to go now, but um, I am very interested and would like to be involved as much as I can. Not as a host family, but working behind the scenes. Thank you. And that's, and that's really what it, you know, not all of us do have the capacity to like, you know, be super involved, but everything helps. So I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more and I'm so excited. This group has new people, experienced people. And so I really think this is a great group to, you know, take on two families as well. Um, Steven. Hi. Hi. Um, yep. Bye. My video back on. Hi. Um, if I miss this, I apologize, but when is all of this taking place? When, when are these families arriving? Um, yes, so we have been receiving, um, we've received 51 and we are to receive 150. So we're a third of the way there. 
Um, when do they come? They come, mm, and I did say this, but it, every, it's a lot of information, so repeating it. Um, we will find out that we, we uh, they'll update our spreadsheet and we'll get their names maybe a few weeks ahead of time. Um, it, well, we don't know what day they're coming. We don't know what time they're coming. We get that information up to 78 to 42 hours beforehand. And so I will be like, I really like to keep groups like this. So we have individuals coming. We have like small families, couples, and then we have big families. I really like to, um, cause I have a lot of individuals who are not with the group. I like to get them with the smaller groups. And then these, like, we, I just had a family of seven and a, um, I'll help Methodist jumped in to help save the day. It was great. You know? Um, so like the bigger families for, um, our groups. Um, but I was communicating with them. I'm like, all right, I think we're going to get your family. I called up uh, Shannon Baxter and I was like, Hey, um, are you guys ready? You ready to get started? We have a family for you. So you won't get the family like right at first. We will be starting up in January again. Um, but I don't have like, this is the date. It will be me calling up be like, all right, you guys ready? Um, <laughs> families come in and then we'll, um, and then you'll say yes. And I'll say, all right, I'll get you the details later, but go ahead and start gathering the troops for airport arrival and for the food and, and for gathering groceries. A lot of our families, or a lot of our groups will also supply um, groceries for their temporary home and then also supply their pantry and their permanent home. Um, you don't have to, but it just, a lot of groups will and it, it's above and beyond. It's amazing. Um, but then, you know, a few days before, when we know the details, I'll call you and say, all right, airport arrival, 7 p.m. on a Thursday. Let me tell you, <laughs> we do get a lot of evening ones. Um, and the one that we had uh, on Monday was 7 p.m. And then it got delayed to 9 in the afternoon, we found out. And then after that, it was delayed until like 11 o'clock. And... Mm -hmm the church stuck around and they helped us. Well, that doesn't normally happen. I'm just saying um, it can be a little scramble because we're figuring it out as we get the information. Yeah. A long answer, but <laughs> just so you know the context of, of, of it. And then you'll know I'll be in contact with you about when they're moving. All right, do you guys have the stuff? Do you have, what items do you have? What do we need to get? But we may not have, I'll be like, we're going to do the move in sometime next week. I'll let you know what day. So it, it lately, and I hope by the time that we're, or we're getting caught up right now, uh, we're not having any more arrivals for the rest of the year. So we can get caught up. And then the new year, hopefully we are, I can be a little bit more specific with you. I just want to set your expectations though, to be very patient and flexible with us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, you, you know, that's actually another question. What expectations have been set with these people upon what in coming uh, in arriving here? What do they that's, expect? Do, do you a, know? That's a good question. I think it does vary. Um, I think that they have. I think there's also mixed expectations. Um, I, I don't know. I think someone on the military base told them they're going to get a lot more assistance, like money. Um, so I think some of them uh, were expecting that. Um, but for the most part, I think it is just like um, they do expect, you know, that the resettle that we will help them get their identification, we'll help them get a job. But we do have to be um, very explicit. And I told my caseworkers, you know, we have to be very explicit about, all right, we are going to help you get a job. Like we are going to. So I don't know what their expectations were beforehand, but we, are, we do try to be very clear when they get here, what they can expect from us. Um, but I think there have been some mixed signals. And again, that's just going to add to this restlessness that they're like, oh, well, I was told, I was told this um, while I was waiting. And it is what it is. Um, this is what we have for them. So mm, a little, yeah, it's a mixed answer, but um, we try to make it clear. And again, that's why I stressed for you all to help build their trust in the process. Um, I don't think they're as clear on, on every little thing that we do. How are we communicating with them? They, they don't speak English, correct? Many of them? Many of them do not. Um, so 
yeah, uh, crossing sign, the links. Yeah, or... so it's like signing those, you know, and that's why a lot of it's like, hey, I don't know, and it's hard for me to express all that. Talk to your case manager about, you know, about the process of everything. You know, they're worried about, oh, I need to get my kid in school. Talk to your caseworker. You don't have to explain all that. Um, and then you can use a Google Translate. There are some gaps. It's not perfect translation, but it does help. Uh, oh, that's yeah. a good idea. So you you can type something in in English and it comes out in Afghani, mm -hmm. right? Oh, and then well, that's it, good. speak it out loud or you can show it to them. Sometimes I'll just like text with the clients and they'll text me and then I have to translate it and back and forth. And, and that helps. Like I said, we do have a remote translator for like the really... Like when we sit down with our caseworkers, like we have a we have a translator because we want them to be very clear. <laughs> we don't want any gaps. So, um, but you know, we do ask you will kind of navigate those language barriers. Okay, okay. I wasn't thinking about that that we could actually do it with our computer and our phones, and that's the benefit out. of modern society. I know there are some perks, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, another big project for the community. I know, and it's um, like I said, we're receiving a great response from the Savannah community. Many people want to give like this or you know, donate items. We got a church, and they donated holiday gifts, so all of our kids got Christmas presents. Um, you know, people will just donate uh, coats and mittens, and you know that helps. And then some people do have the capacity to do this um, to give their homes. So it is beautiful to see. And we have, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're almost, we're keeping above, we're treading water, but the community is so encouraging that we're really getting a, a handle on it. Um, and what's great too, is that Savannah, we do have a small population of, well, for, for this, we do have some Afghani uh, migrants who went through the program five years ago and now they're settled and they're wanting to connect to this new. Oh, that's great. Yes, and that you know that's invaluable for them to connect with people who have been through the process, and now they, you know, they have a good job. Because at first, you know, the job may not be ideal. Sometimes you got to start from the bottom and work your way up. So a lot of it's like hospitality jobs or um, manual labor. Um, and unfortunately, with this population, Afghani's, um, especially the ones who are, had the resources to escape, you know, we have engineers we have computer programmers we have people who have master's degrees but none of that translates over unfortunately um and so again you may notice that like you know one of our clients i mean he was like top tier doing real well for himself like three cars and now he's like how do i feed my five children on this money in america you know and i think a lot of a lot of people get from other countries get their perspective of america from our media and our media and all these movies, it's like, it's not like that. Like the struggle is real here um, for all of us who, who are from here even. So all that to just say, um, they, um, they have come from very, some of them are very, um, come from means. And so again, that's why we want to restore their dignity, work on those dependencies, um, because again, they're aware of that that hierarchy, and so again, we want to help. We don't want to, um, you know, they don't want. No one wants to be treated like a charity case, no matter what population, whether it's refugees or houseless or or um, victims of violence. Like no one wants to be treated that way. Anyways, da -da -da. how are the children doing in school? Um, I would say. So they do have an ESL program, um, a couple of the schools do. So they are uh, assigned to a school that has the capacity to work with students who English is not their second language or is not their first language. Um, and, you know, it's different. Some, um, one of, he's 15 or up there and we always place them in a grade below. So they will go through an assessment and they get put in the grade below just to make sure. But one of them, he's like, ninth grade, can I have 10th grade? This is a breeze, you know? And then some people struggle a little bit more than others. But that's where we do have our after school program where we work with the kids. We help tutor them. We have great tutors who really kind of um, help to break down their um, struggle areas. And the school really works with us too to communicate. 
So, and it varies. So basically we probably need to have a meeting for us and just decide what we want to do. Yeah, absolutely. I would say internally, and I'm sure that might elicit more questions and I'm fine to, um, to attend the back end of it or even to come to it or I'm sure afterwards, again, that point person, me and you could sit down and talk about what you went through. But yeah, so I think that would be necessary for you all to figure it out. But again, we won't start receiving people until January and I don't anticipate getting you assigned a group you know, right from the bat in January. So you do have some time. Uh, and we, of course we won't assign until you're ready, but just in the next few weeks, this is, we can get you started. So again, so very excited. Oh uh, yes, um, BH Levy, Levy, I'm so sorry. I, I have, I have a, a very simple question. Um, you're based in Savannah, I gather. How, yes. how many other in spirit of staff people are there in Savannah who are working in refugee resettlement? Good question. So when I first started, um, like I said, I'm new here, but I have gone the crash course. So we have our client service manager. When I was hired, we had one caseworker and she was going, she was so stressed out. So we have hired new people. Um, so we had that one caseworker. We have a youth service coordinator. Um, we have our unemployment specialist, and then we just hired, so Nosy left, the caseworker. Well, we just hired two new ones, and then we have an intensive case manager. So we have seven staff members, um, two case managers, and they are, now they're doing a great job, but it's a lot of cases. We will have an intern come back in January, so our intern helps out. Okay. So there is a substantial support staff. That's good. Yes. Well, there is now. There is now. Um, but well, some of them are new, and so that is kind of a, a another another gap too. But they we're we're all learning. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And again, you know, our volunteers really help our caseworkers to do their job more effectively because they have so many cases. You really help to fill in the gaps and helping to get those first thirty days to go very smoothly. So you guys have great questions. I love it. I um, love answering. And I, you know, I may not know all the answers either, but I will definitely find out. Um, any other questions before we close? Well, in that case, I'll hand it over to you, Rabbi Haas. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and I can't wait to start this wonderful journey with you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. We really appreciate it. And for all of you stayed, I appreciate it. I know it's uh, it's late, but um, the holidays for many people in terms of leaving. Thank you, Lindsay. That was fabulous. We're looking forward to working with you. I know I got to work with you in your previous organization. So um, if anybody has any other questions, we, you know, we have our email and our phone number. And then I'll send out a night. Hopefully we'll set up a meeting and we can decide if we want to take a family, two families, if anybody wants to be the point person and and then get back to you hopefully uh, pretty soon. And so anybody who's watching on YouTube uh, later in the next couple of days, um, we'll, we'll send out, they'll just email me that you've watched it and we need to make sure everybody goes through the other two steps, which is the uh, registering and uh, sending in the, check, uh, the background check. I will say about the background check, if you feel like you um, cannot work with the family directly, if you just wanna help, coordinate donations or whatever like you don't have to be background checked it's only like for direct service and direct okay, contact thanks yes all right well until next time happy holidays y'all um and enjoy your evening thank you for staying up late with us thank you everybody and i'll be emailing everybody thank you hey. thank, thank you night, everyone Good night. everybody Good night. and Lindsay, merry christmas